Hey, everybody. I'm Terry Connerman with QS Kickers, and welcome today. Good to see everybody. Um, we tried a new little thing uh, as far as like the, the, the like lead in thing. So I'm not quite sure. So bear with me for a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, just a reminder that if you, um, that we're, we're recording the screens, and so if you don't want to be seen on screen, um, please turn off your camera. Um, we have everybody automatically muted, and we're not going to have time for questions today. We're going to be really um, tight on time. But today, um, thanks to Assis, thanks to our amazing sponsors, um, we have Amgen, AstraZeneca, Marathi, and Revolution Med that we'd like to be able to thank for being able to provide this programming for everybody. And I'm excited to be able to continue the conversation. This is part two. We're continuing on with, um, with Dr. Eric Koenig from, uh, oh my gosh, and my screen just went blank. And it's not like I don't know where you are, but I'm glad that I'm glad that you're here. So we're continuing the conversation, genetics, genomics, and biomarker testing um, from, from like last time. Uh, the event is part of our BAM, Biomarker Awareness Moments. And let's uh, see, Dr. Eric Connick is responsible for the design implementation and clinical evaluation of advanced lab methods to help patients like us with a wide variety of diseases. And we appreciate the fact that you're able to use what it is that you have and that you're joining with us today. Um, his, his MD is from the University of Utah and he's board certified in molecular genetic pathology, clinical pathology and anatomic pathology. That's a lot of pathology by the American Board of Pathology. And your academic interests include intersection of germline and somatic mutation testing in malignancy, the use of automation and software to reduce the laboratory errors, which we are all for. And so thanks for coming back with us today on this huge topic and the important topics. So thanks for joining us, Eric. Oh, I think you're muted. You need to unmute. Yes, I, I was unable to mute, unmute. So, no, thanks for having me back. So, we probably need to kind of like just get at it because last time we were talking like the germline, the somatic, and what it meant and how how it looks, right, mm -hmm. um, and what it means to us. And so, I'm going to let you just kind of continue on with the presentation, and uh, we'll kind of go through go from there. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can share. Maybe. Is it not sharing? Mm. It's no. Kind of frozen. Hang on. Oh, no. Try try again. If I could oh. sing, I would sing to it fill the space here, but um yeah, it's kind of is it frozen? Well, it's kind of stuck in a, in uh it's saying select a oh. desktop and it's frozen. Yeah. I don't know. There's been gremlins in my computer all week. And then there was an update that came through and that seemed to solve some of my problems. Let's see. Mm. Yeah. I'm giving the, the spinning wheel. The spinning wheel of death? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> refresh, Wait, and try, refresh and try again. I, I changed a couple of sheer screen things in hopes that we can we can get that resolved. Thank you guys for putting up with it. I'm happy to see everybody here today. You know, spring is starting to spring in Charlotte, North Carolina. So first of the season of allergies. Still not working. Uh oh, I think we lost him. And I think he's going to have to come back again. But just just to keep everybody in the loop, um, uh, in case you missed the big excitement yesterday, um, Kavan Shokat, who is the person that found the, the pocket in order to be able to use the G12C inhibitor, uh, was awarded a million dollars and an honorary, I don't know how you say it, sort of Sojin? or something. Um, and so that was pretty exciting that we were just out there just like two, three weeks ago. 
I was pretty excited to see that he won that and know that that million dollars is going to go to good use to be able to keep going with the research. Uh, that G12C inhibitor, even though it's not for me specifically, I know it's going to make a difference for all of us because that's kind of where, um, where the lessons have come from and where it's going to be learned from. So, yeah, so never feel like it's like it's left out. Okay, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing the doctor come back. Come back, Eric. Um, next up on March the 1st, we're going to have um, all this and what does it mean for me as a patient. We're going to have uh, see Beth Sandy from University of Pennsylvania. She's a nurse practitioner. I think it's at noon Eastern time. Stay, keep an eye on the event schedule to make sure that you know what's going on with that because that's where it's going to take all of this information and kind of like, what is it I'm looking for on a report? And it's not going to be specific to just if I have a specific type of company's report, it's going to be much more vague in general so that we can have a little bit better understanding of what it means. Like a lot of times we'll see, like we'll say GLY dot one, two dot greater than CYS or something and kind of take those sorts of things and break it down in addition to like the different percentages and such. And well, just while we're sitting around waiting, let's see, make sure that you guys have signed up. Well, you guys are already signed up and, and see me in here. Does anybody have anything they want to like, just like throw a shout out in the, in the chat while I'm filling time because um, we ha are having technical difficulties on our end here. Okay, so rather than having no Q&A at the end of the session, okay. And we do have everybody's mutes off. So if, so we don't have any um, issues. In the past, we've had background noise that just kind of came up suddenly out of nowhere. No doubt somebody accidentally hit their space bar or something. And then we heard dogs barking and stuff. So, um, well, let's see what else we have going on. We also have coming up, um, I'm going to be going to, let's see, Hope, Hope Summit is May the 5th. If you are, a lung cancer um, patient, um, let's see. And we've got also coming up, we've got, uh, oh, here he comes. We also have coming up in uh, March. There he is, he's back again. Got me scared there for a minute, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, I've never. I don't have don't songs and dancing, so I mean, they're they were hurting out here, and I can keep and I can keep talking a long time. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that happen before, where uh, my computer actually rebooted; it just kind of died and started up again. Um, so anyway, no, no um, worries. I told you it's it's the Gremlins this week, and so yeah, it's it's not just my computer. Okay, second time is the charm, right? Absolutely. All right, find where I was. Okay. All right. Okay, so you should be able to see a PowerPoint. Yes. Ah, nice. Now only a single screen. Uh, let's see. Hang on. So yes. Okay. So um some of the questions that you had uh, posed were all kind of around inheritance. And so, you know, whether or not uh, somebody had cancer, will their children get it? Um, you know, are all cancer genes inherited, et cetera. So I put all these together because I, I kind of think they're, they're related. And so um, the thing to remember that, you know, we're, we're really complicated um, organisms. And so, we're made up of, of DNA or the, the genetic code that codes for all the proteins that mess up is contained in DNA. And so we have about 6 billion letters in that genetic code. And we get half of that from each of our parents. So, so we say 3 billion times two. So that, that's a huge amount of information. Um, it works out to be about 20,000 genes or so, plus or minus a few thousand. Um, and we have at least two copies of every gene. And so the way this works out is that um, every gene we have, we inherit one from each one of our parents. And some genes, we actually have multiple 
uh, redundant copies because they're so important or uh, just for evolutionary reasons, we have multiple copies of each gene. And then the thing to remember is that every single time our cells divide, you have to copy all of those 6 billion letters and you have to get right pretty much a single time. And so, you know, we all are start out as a little cell and then, you know, we become the, the trillions of cells that we are as individuals and our cells are constantly turning over. And every time they turn over, they have to divide. And so you have to copy all this uh, information every single time. And so it's a, it's a huge problem in terms of like uh, logistics, I guess is a way to think about it. So it, so does, does this happen regularly that there's mistakes in the coding and the replication of it? Yeah, and I, uh, I'll i get to that a little bit, kind of what the, the mistakes are. And so, you know, you would think that, um, you know, after all the, the billions of years of evolution and everything else that, you know, this would have been a problem that was solved, um, but still mistakes happen. Uh, they don't happen very often, but they do. And so, um, you know, the, there's this tension between, you know, why are these mistakes happening and a quote unquote reason for them happening. Uh, so I was going to kind of get to that a little bit. Um, and, and just reminding everybody that, you know, we have our DNA, which is kind of the, the instruction set. And the cool thing about DNA is that we actually have, um, there, there are two strands of DNA that work together. And so basically each one is, is a copy that is used for when the cells divide. So they actually take half of the original DNA and then fill in, in the breaks essentially. And so um, that's a, a really neat way to make sure that uh, it's easier to copy it every single time. So the DNA is turned into a temporary molecule called RNA, and this is what's used to create proteins and, and do other things. And RNA is, is very similar to DNA, except it only has one strand instead of the two. And then proteins are, um, amino acids that, that are put together to do functional things. And so um, hopefully everybody's seen something like this, uh, this square where basically you have you know, parent one, parent two, and they have one copy of, of different, what we call alleles, different forms of each gene. And these form different properties. So if you have the, the big B in this case, you have a, a purple flower. If you have a big B and a little B, that still gives you a purple flower. But if you have two of these small bees, that gives you a white flower. And so this is just kind of the, the simple underlying basis of genetics that uh, Gregor Mendel discovered, I don't know, 150, 170 years ago. Uh, so this is kind of the, the underlying uh, issue of hereditary, heredi uh, heredity. Okay, so when I was talking about DNA fidelity, so there's all these things that have um, evolved to basically make that copying um, high fidelity. So every single time that the DNA is copied, there's as few mistakes as possible. And so um, here's a, a diagram of some of those. And so maybe you might have heard of some of these things. So uh, if you've ever um, known somebody who has Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome patients have a defect in one of these four genes. And these four genes, um, when their proteins are expressed, they repair mismatches. So when there's mistakes in the genome, it goes in there, fixes it, puts in the correct thing. Um, we have polymerases, which um, basically copy the DNA. And these polymerases have something called a proofreading. And so they basically check their work as they go. And if there's a mistake, they correct it on site and then they move on. And then we have uh, multiple versions of these polymerases. So they do different things. Uh, and then we have other mechanisms that recognize DNA damage, for example, and uh, correct those mistakes. So there's all these different things that are going on in every single cell to correct mistakes that are made when DNA is replicated. Okay. So when we were thinking about uh, heredity, uh, here's an example. So this is using an example of a, a left-handed trait. Um, and so you can see here that the way we, we designate this um, in a pedigree is basically um, you know, circles mean that the, or circles are squares so of men, women, if it's not colored, they don't have the trait. If it's split like this, it means that they carry it. So one copy of a gene for right-handed trait, one copy for left-handed. So same in mom and dad here. And then when it's a full color, that means you inherited both of the, the halves for that particular trait from the parents. And so uh, this is what we call recessive. So that means that the parents don't have that, that trait, but the son does. And so this son, when they pass it on to their children, because they have um, 
you know, two copies actually should go to uh, both of their children, should get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. And then you can see over time, you know, this person expresses the trait, this person doesn't, this person expresses the trait. So this is, this is an example of heredity in action. Uh, so, okay. So this is kind of getting to the, the mistakes. So even with all this machinery in, in every single cell um, to make sure that mistakes don't happen, there, there is a small number. So one in 10 to the eight. So this is a one with eight zeros behind it. And so if you do the math on that, roughly um, there are 30 changes in that out of that 6 billion uh, in every generation. So my kids you know, inherited half of my, my uh, genome and they have 30 differences between, you know, if you were to sequence me and my wife, um, they have 30 that are different. And so where do those, those all come from? And so it's basically that despite all these, these machinery to make the copies as high fidelity as possible, mistakes happen. And so, you know, that, that brings up this question of like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, you would think it'd be doing better by now, but you know, it doesn't quite. Okay, so keep that, that 30 changes per generation per person per generation in mind. So this is, um, this is something, some, uh, some theoretical work some of my colleagues did a couple of years ago where they had this idea of, you know, we know how many different changes happen in every genome with every generation. And so what that means is that every single one of us has new changes in our genome that have never been seen before. Uh, it doesn't exist in anybody else, doesn't exist in our parents. You know, we didn't pass it down to our kids, so it's just us. And so um, if you think about how many people there are on the planet, and then you think about, well, some changes are going to be really bad and, and you're not going to be able to develop into a full person, you know, so it would just be a, a lethal change. Um, so some of those changes just won't be compatible with life. So if you exclude all those and you look at the population size, what we think today is that because we have, you know, more than 7 billion people on earth and the number of changes we basically identify we basically at this point in time there's at least one person alive today that has every possible change in the human genome and so we're all it just kind of gets back to this idea that we're all unique right at some level and so this is just a, a factor between the uh, the rate of changes in the genome versus the population size and so if we were to test everybody in the, the world today, we would identify every possible change that we think is compatible with life. Okay. So, okay. And so um, some of these genome changes, they happen in the, the sperm and the egg. And so, you know, that means that, um, you know, the parents may not have a particular change, but a, a change may have happened in one of their, their gametes or one of the, the sperm or egg cells that will be passed on to their kids. And then, you know, every time a cell divides, there's a chance for a new change to happen in that cell. And so these kind of spontaneous changes happen uh, and they happen with every cell division. So you can imagine that, you know, uh, we start out with a, a fresh set of cells as, you know, a single cell, and then we go to a child and, and things are still relatively new and fresh. And by the time we get to be a hundred or even more, hopefully, uh, there are so many changes in our genome that weren't there in the beginning, just because our cells have divided so many times. So, you know, these changes can hurt, occur during development and throughout life. Okay. So, so why does all this stuff happen, right? And it all comes back to this idea of natural selection. And so, because all this stuff is ran, and so we don't, uh, you can't predict what your environment is going to have. So you can imagine in this example of a giraffe or a proto giraffe that, you know, they were, they were shorter animals. They didn't have as long a necks, et cetera. And, you know, some of the changes that happened in their genome just happened to give them longer necks. And so the environment they were living in, you know, they had these tall trees. And so the giraffes, the longer necks and longer legs, they could eat the leaves of the higher trees. And so these are the, the giraffes that survived. And so then when they mated with giraffes that also had longer necks and longer legs, that trait, became fixed in that population. And then the, the animals that didn't have those traits weren't able to reproduce and weren't able to pass on that, uh, that trait. And so we, we actually see this in action. And so this is kind of the, the big discovery of Darwin uh, in the Galapagos Islands was this idea of he, he looked at all these different birds and these little islands and they were all very, very specialized. And so you had some 
some birds that had very specific beaks that were, you know, for fruit and, and buds. And the other birds at a different island had these really long skinny beaks to get grubs out of the ground. And then, you know, this particular type of finch had like a ability to use tools. Uh, this one, you know, would eat insects, this one would eat leaves. And so they were really well adapted to this. And so the same, same process. So basically, if we think of, you know, there was some sort of um, progenitor uh, finch, and basically each one of the, the different um, children of, of that finch had different variants and some variants were adaptable and, and favored based on the environment. So those got passed on and so they get passed on, passed on. And so that's, that's how all this random change within the genome is actually something that's never going to be, no matter how many, um, how long evolution happens in our, our species, it's never going to really truly be um, fixed because this process uh, needs to happen. And so there's this balance between having mutations um, that are going to add uh, advantages and then, you know, changes in the genome. So unfortunately, sometimes what happens is rather than, you know, developing a change that lets you eat, you know, fruit or buds or something like that, you can have a change in one of the oncogenes or tumor suppressors that we talked about last time. And so you can imagine that's how, how um, you can have a gene where there's a change that increases a risk for cancer that can be passed down from parents to children to grandchildren, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me see if I've got this. Okay. All right, to use your giraffe example, right? As the, even though with the long necked giraffes, which I mean, it only makes sense, right? They're, the other ones are gonna starve out if they can't reach the food, okay? That, that's kind of like a natural process of the natural selection, right? And so as they're, as they're duplicating, as they're breeding and they're making little baby giraffes with other long necks, okay? Um, at the same time, there's still the possibility as the um, DNA starts replicating in the M and into the RNA, that could potentially cause a cancer. And so, I don't know, it sounds almost like you're saying that we're never gonna cure cancer because we're not going to stop mutations. Is that is that kind of where we're getting to? Well, so there's always gonna be change. So every generation uh, is gonna have different changes in their genome that their parents didn't have. Okay. And so um, we see that in, um, you know, we, we do a lot of testing for, for kids at the pediatric hospital. And so, you know, they're, they're these, you know, small kids that have developed cancers and um, they, when we test their, their cancer and we test their blood, for example, we can find mutations that say that um, they have a mutation in TP53. And so that's the, a gene that's associated with leaf round eating syndrome. And so what that means is that they're at really, really high risk for getting lots of different cancers at a very young age. Uh, and that's well established. But if we test their parents, their parents don't have that that variant in their genes. So the parents don't have leaf round eating syndrome, but the child does. And you know, so what happened was at some point, you know, either in the parents' uh, sperm cells or egg cells, you know, that change happened, and that was passed on to the kid, or that that child um, very early in development had a change happen in their DNA that um, picked up a mutation in TP53, and then they you know, that's a new variant in that, that particular child. And so we're always going to have things like that happen. Um, there's no way to um, prevent that. But what we can do is when we do identify a, a mutation in, a, uh, in the germline of a patient, you know, that predisposes them to cancer, then we can actually do things like um, intervene. And we can say, well, there, you know, there are screening tests we can do. So uh, we think of like BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, so we do, you know, breast cancer screening. Uh, we may do, you know, some tests for ovarian cancer or prostate cancer in the future, you know, and so that way we can detect cancers earlier and then you can remove them. Uh, there's also- but A lot of times, and we see, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt. Oh, um, go ahead. Okay, so a lot of times we'll see on our reports, TP53. Does that mean we just had more of a tendency to get a cancer? No. So TP50, so TP53 is a is a great example because it's a gene that is very commonly mutated in cancers. And so the reason is is that um, uh, TP53 has a has a big role in um, deciding whether or not cells divide. 
is a simplified way to think about it. And so when you have a cancer cell, if it can take out TP53, if you will, then it can divide more than it should, right? Which is one of the things that cancers do. And so something like 70 odd percent of cancers will have mutations in TP53, but that mutation is just in the cancer. So it's not in all the other cells of that person most of the time. Okay. And um, so, so I guess that's part of the distinction is like, what makes me not a giraffe is the fact, right? No, well, I mean, it, it, what makes me not a giraffe is the fact that I don't, neither one of my parents were, and I didn't inherit any sort of giraffe. I certainly did go long enough. To, I didn't get giraffe <laughs> tendencies, right? Okay. So, I mean, that's where it's starting, right? But the, the same thing with the TP53, that's only within the actual cancer. It's not necessarily in my base genome. Am I saying that exactly correct? I think it's a good way to think about it. I think it's a, a base genome is probably a, a reasonable way to think about. It. So that, that's kind of like most of the cells in your body would have the, the base genome. And so um, there's this, so mosaicism is kind of what I was getting towards. So basically, again, we start out as one single cell and then divide. And if you have a, you know, there's all kinds of variants that happen early in development. Most of the time what happens is if that, if we have a uh, variant that happens that's not uh, good for the organism, those cells will be killed. Uh, that's just the, the, there's all kinds of mechanisms to help prevent these from becoming a, a cancer or something. In other places, basically, you know, in this case, we have a, a variant that's in blue and this, um, you know, offers some growth advantage. Maybe this, you know, has a, a cancer predisposition, something like that. And so that gets passed on to, you know, when that cell divides, it gets passed on to the daughter cells and then so on and so forth. And so then when we have, you know, our final person, then what we have is some cells have the, the blue variant, some cells have this green variant that that happen later because we all you know, start as one cell and then and grow out. And so you can see things like this, where basically um, this, this particular patient has a, a mosaicism for pigmentation on their skin. And so the cells that make up their right arm and right back, these acquired some variant uh, early in development, and this is where all those cells land, and that causes this, this increased pigmentation that we can see. You know, and then the cells on the other side of his body, uh, which came from a different starting point, um, basically don't have that pigmentation. So you can kind of see this in, in um, you know, some people or, or um, uh, in, in other conditions. So this is kind of a, this isn't malignant or, or cancer or anything like that, but it's an example of the, the same process. Okay, so remind me again, the difference between somatic and germline. So germline is basically the genetic code that you inherited from your parents. So from the sperm and the egg when they came together. And then somatic is anything after that point, essentially. So it's in a subset of your cells versus you know that that base genome, like you mentioned. Okay, so in this particular case, the somatic, um, how do you say that? Mosaicism. Mosaicism. Yeah, mosaicism. like a like a tile mosaic. Yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, but yeah. But yeah, but you're using fancy words on me, and I've got <laughs> like you know, um, I, I I got used to some of the science words, and then you go throw a, like a tile word at me. Okay, <laughs> but the, the somatic part of it just means that. He wasn't born with that tendency from his parents. And so it's not like, you know, his parents had that too. Exactly, exactly. So this is something that happened sometime during this person's uh, development, you know, from a single cell to, you know, a fully formed human. Um, and, you know, that's a, this is common. We're all, if you look hard enough, we're all mosaics at some level. Like if you look at the genetic level, you can find mosaic populations in everybody. Uh, that's not necessarily good or bad. That's just you know part of the the developmental process. And then occasionally we can see uh, mosaicism because they um, just because it's so extreme in that one individual. Okay, so what I keep kind of hearing keep coming back to is that there's part of like the the base genome, okay, of you. And then there's within a tumor, wherever this cancer occurs, okay, whatever type of cancer it may be, wherever it is, that has its different own little, um, I don't know, its own little biology, its own little set of genomes within it. Is that is that right? And so if that, I have TP53 in my cancer, that doesn't mean it's throughout my body. It means it's within the cancer. And the same thing, whether I'm KRAS G12C or, or what have you, correct? 
Exactly. And, you know, I think the, I think that way of thinking about it where the, the cancer cells kind of have its own little genome is, is a good way of thinking about it because it is, um, it's very similar to, to our base genome, if you will. Um, but really there are just, you know, uh, a certain number of changes at the genetic level and then, you know, other levels on top of that, um, that make it so that it grows inappropriately and, and does things that it shouldn't do. And so that's how it becomes a cancer, right? Is it, it grows for growth's sake and, and invades other tissues. Okay, well, kind of uh, related, but kind of unrelated. Is that kind of what they mean when they're talking about the microbiome of a cancer? Or, I mean, is this kind uh, of like a good place to kind of like get a little- that's a, Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the microbiome is something that's even different. So like we, um, you know, uh, we, we, if you were to sequence all the DNA in a person, it's not all human, right? So there's there's um, a huge amount of like bacterial DNA and probably viral DNA, and um, these are bacteria that uh, we we live with, and so we we have an, a a living arrangement, right? So we provide them shelter and they do stuff for us, and so you can think of things like our our gut and, and things like that. So there's you know probably thousands or hundreds of thousands of different kinds of bacteria that live with us all the time on our skin and in our body. And so within some tumor cells um, or within some some tumors, there is um, you know a microenvironment of you know bacteria and viruses and things like that that you know change based on what's going on in the tumor. Um, and then there's this other idea of a microenvironment where you know like maybe it's a different um, the environment is different for like immune cells and things like that. And so, you know, how they behave and interact with each other. So there's multiple different levels, uh, of, um, you know, immune microenvironment or microenvironment. So. Okay. Yeah. It's it, the more we look, the more complicated it gets. Um, yeah. So. You got me all excited. It's like, oh, so I might actually be part giraffe. And like, <laughs> Well, that's that's kind of the crazy thing is that um, we we are so especially um, if you look at mammals and and even reptiles and birds and things like that we are so similar, and um, you know we've uh, like we do a lot of uh, research testing along with our our patient testing, and so we've we've actually had um, people submit like tumors from mice, and they they actually. Um, like our bioinformatics pipelines treat it the same as human. It just looks like it has a whole bunch of, of uh, benign changes in their genome. Um, and, but you can look at it and say, you know, it's 99% the same uh, from so a is little Is that how they can too. study with mice and see how something's going to work for us? In some ways, yeah. So there's different, there's different techniques you can use. So you can um, basically take human cancers and, and basically transplant them on mice. Uh, special mice, and then you can give them, you know, drugs and things like that, and see how the tumor responds. And then a lot of the basic research, a lot of the the basic um, cellular machinery is very similar. And it also explains why, you know, we do a lot of experiments in mice, and it looks really promising. And then we go to humans, and it doesn't work, right? Because we are different. Um, so there's, you know, advantages and disadvantages uh, for doing, you know, experiments with with animal models. Um, and so remember, I, I was saying that you know we all as we uh, age, we accumulate uh, variants in our genome. So here's, uh, this is an older study from more than 10 years ago, but what they looked at was uh, patients who didn't have cancer and patients who did have cancer at different ages. And then, you know, what the um, percent of their genome that they could sequence was uh, variant, had variants. And so you can see, you know, people who are uh, 45, you know, which is seeming younger and younger every year, um, you know, they didn't have that many variants, but then we started looking at people in their, you know, mid to late seventies, the P, even the people without cancer had a lot, you know, 2% of their, their genes, you could find uh, changes in their, their genes compared to um, their base genome. And then what was interesting is that people with cancer actually had a slightly higher number of changes. And that was kind of across the board, you know, over uh, as you, you age. So, you know, thinking about that, you know, one of the reasons why we see more cancers as we get older is just our cells have had more times to to replicate and chance to accumulate more changes. And if you accumulate enough of the wrong changes, then a cancer can develop. And then you know, this kind of suggests that maybe there's something different about about folks who at older ages you know, have cancer. And so, you know, if we think about this in terms of what we do know, so we think about you know. Um, you know, so I think about my grandfather who was, he was a coal miner and he smoked like three packs of cigarettes a day. 
And so he he died of long, of a non of small cell lung cancer at I think it was around 70, something like that. But he had a huge exposure risk from from all the carcinogens that he was taking into his lungs over decades. Right. And and so we think about, you know, things like that that are environmental or or uh, uh, cultural, for example, that can cause cancers. And that, but at the same time, you know, um, folks who don't have cancer, just, you know, they're still accumulating mutations. They just haven't accumulated all the mutations they needed to develop a cancer yet. So, okay. So that all comes back to this idea of, you know, if, if someone has cancer, will their children get it? Will their grandchildren get it? And like, there's so many different factors. And so, um, you know, number one is, is whatever it is that um, predisposed somebody to cancer, is it inherited? That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing we have to think about is this idea of dominant or recessive. And what that means is, you know, do we need just need one copy from one parent to pass it on? Or do you need a, a copy from each parent to pass it on? Um, so dominant is, is one copy, recessive is you need two copies. There's this other idea called penetrance. And so this is this idea where um, I may have a, a particular change that predisposes me to cancer, but if we look at a huge population of people with that same change, maybe only 20% of people will get cancer. Whereas if we look at something that has a really, really strong association, so the, those TP53 mutations um, that are inherited, you know, those patients have leaf round meaning syndrome. We think that, you know, probably 80, 90% of those, those patients will have at least one cancer in their life. So there's this huge spectrum, but depending on what genes were inherited from whom. And then the other part is just the, this idea of phenotype. So, you know, we inherit these genes from, from our uh, parents, but uh, our environment has a huge impact on things, what genes are, are turned on, turned off. Um, and then there's just this, this uh, element of luck, right? So like, as we grow and develop, what changes happen in our genome? Um, you know, do we live in an environment where we get lots of exposure to things that, that can cause damage to DNA? Or do we have a, a good repair mechanism? So there, there's, there's lots of things at play. And so um, autosomal dominant is kind of what we, we think of uh, a lot of times when we think of inherited cancer risk, because it can be so striking when you look at it across, you know, multiple generations of a family. So, you know, so here, you know, um, you know, looking at this is what, five generations. And so we can see in this, this generation, you know, two sisters and then two brothers both had some sort of, of cancer. So kidney cancer, skin cancer, unknown cancer. And then if we follow this, this woman's, uh, lineage, we can see that, you know, multiple uh, of her kids had cancer, but then other kids didn't. And then of the kids that did have cancer, you know, some of their children had cancer. And so this is a very much an, an autosomal dominant picture. And so again, this is something, um, you know, Lee Fraumini syndrome or BRCA1, BRCA2 inherited cancer syndromes. Um, and then and there's a bunch of others as well. But you know these these can be really striking because you see that cancer in every single generation, and so a lot of the the guidelines for doing germline testing were originally developed on uh, developed based on families like this. And so uh, if you look at some of the BRCA um, recommendations, you know it's like cancers in multiple generations, you know cancers before a certain age. So this you know child, for example, had um, cancer at three years old and passed away at three years old. Uh, this patient had cancer at 47. So that's where a lot of the, those guidelines came from, was, was studying folks like this. Okay, so the word autosomal, is that using that word somatic in there as well? Is that where that's coming from? Um, so so, autos, so okay. there, there, there are different types of um, chromosomes. So there's autosomes and sex chromosomes. And so the sex chromosomes decide whether or not um, you're going to be genetically male or female. That's the, the XY split and then all the others the other 222 chromosomes are called autosomal so because sex chromosomes are special because you could think of um, so for example a man has an x and a y so every one of his sons will inherit his y chromosome and every single one of his daughters will inherit his x chromosome none of his sons will inherit his x chromosome so there, there's special uh, ways that geneticists think about sex chromosomes versus autosomes because autosomes, you have 
two copies. Okay, so autism just means it's not from your gender. Yeah, it's not it's not the X or Y chromosome. That's essentially what it means. And then recessive is is um, you need two copies of whatever that gene is to to display that phenotype. So in this this case, you know, both parents, you know, so there's the red and the blue, and so um, only um, individuals who have the red will express whatever that um, that cancer syndrome is. So like mute YH is, is an example of that. And so you can have, basically it skips generations, right? So the parents aren't affected, most of the siblings aren't affected, only this patient. When this patient has children, they're only gonna pass on one copy of the, the gene that we're interested in to each one of their children. So unless these children um, reproduce with somebody who, all, who also carries that gene, their children aren't gonna be affected. So you, you basically see this kind of sporadic effect where you know, this, this is harder for um, geneticists to, to track down because you basically have one person that's affected or maybe like one you know, set of siblings and then next generation, um, it, you don't have it. And so sometimes what we see is, is patients that um, come from really, really tight knit um, uh, sociological groups um, you know, so they don't, they don't marry outside of their social circle, essentially, so that a lot of the genes kind of get concentrated um, within that group. And so, um, you know, the, uh, I'm trying to think of some examples. Would that so they be maybe, like the Ashnikazi? Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the different Jewish populations, they, they tend to not marry outside of their tradition. And so a lot of things that are generally rare in the, the population at large have a higher frequency in the Ashkenazi population. And so um, that, that's a perfect example. Um, and so we see situations like that. And you can also see situations where um, you can imagine um, before we had you know, lots of travel, if you were on a small island, you know, your, um, your choice of partners is gonna be relatively limited. Right, and so the genes that kind of started in the, the people who founded that population, they're going to stick around, and so we see um, interesting effects in, in isolated populations as well. So, but autosomal recessive. This is, like I said, this is harder to find, um, you know, and you know it, it comes up occasionally. Uh, but in this case, if it was autosomal recessive, you know, you're unlikely to have your kids be affected unless you um, reproduce with somebody who has the same. Thing. And so exactly like you mentioned the Ashkenazi population, um, there's a lot of like uh, screening tests that are done. So when, when couples are thinking about having kids, they, they both get tested and they can see if they're at risk for any, um, you know, really severe diseases. And then sometimes what they can actually do is um, they'll do like in vitro fertilization and they'll actually test those embryos to see if they're impacted by the disease they're worried about. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's really motivated by um, people who've seen, um, you know, other individuals in their family that have these horrible uh, lethal diseases and, and how much suffering is, is incurred. And so that's why they go through these really extreme measures to, to test themselves and then, you know, test their the embryos before they're actually uh, implanted for a pregnancy. So we don't really do that for cancer syndromes that I can think of. At least I haven't heard of it being common, but other diseases we do it. And then um, this is another tricky one that, that we occasionally see where it's autosomal dominant. So that means that if you get the copy from a parent, you're at risk, but reduced penetrance means that you um, there's that, that issue of maybe only 20% of people will see that that particular disease manifest. And so again, we see this idea of skipping generations. So uh, grandmother was affected, um, but none of her children, well, she only has two children, so neither one of these were affected, but her granddaughter was affected. And so basically, this is a reduced penetrance where basically it's skipping generations. And so this occasionally, this is actually probably more common than than we've appreciated in the past, because as we do more and more of the, um, more and more testing of individuals, uh, we're, we're finding different uh, flavors of this type of of uh, reduced penetrance. Can you give so, me a couple examples of like what that might be or what you what you see? Yeah, so um, a couple of the ones that, that we personally have looked at here, um, we've seen individuals with uh, a variation of Lynch syndrome. Um, so there's, there's multiple genes in Lynch syndrome that can be impacted. 
And uh, PMS2 is one of those genes. And uh, for what a variety of different reasons, it seems like uh, some people who inherit a copy of PMS2 that is definitely damaged that you, know, you would think would predispose them to cancer uh, doesn't do it in everybody. And so we've seen you know, exactly this type of situation where, yeah, you know, my great great grandfather had a cancer. Nobody else in three generations has had it. And then, you know, I have cancer at, you know, 85. And, you know, this person who had cancer at 85 has Lynch syndrome, but they're the first person in their family in, you know, multiple generations, you know, so like probably around 100 years that, that had a cancer. So there's either, it's either reduced penetrance or they have something that's compensating. Um, the other thing we've kind of seen is is some variants of uh, TP53 that um, seem to have a reduced risk of, of having cancer in an individual, um, something that we call, high, just to throw in another fun term, hypomorphic. Um, and so these are, we, we've studied those in prostate cancer patients where some of these uh, men seem to develop cancer slightly earlier, um, but not in the same way that we would expect a, a classically from any patient to develop, you know, three or four cancers before they're 30 years old. So just a, there's some things that we're, we're seeing like that. Uh, but again, these are all areas where there, there may be something entirely different that we're not. Well, and so what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of studying going on. We can't definitively yep. say because I have lung cancer, that means it had nothing to do with some of these other factors. Right. Exactly. I mean, I mean, obviously there's environment and, and, and whatever. And if I was a coal miner smoking three packs a day, I mean, it would probably increase my risk considerably. Right. Okay. But at the same time that there's already kind of a predisposition. So it's just a matter of, you can't always prevent cancer. Exactly. You know, we can, uh, and that, that's kind of the, you know, like the, the final thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, at, at its root, uh, all the cancers we know about are, you know, genetic at some level. There, there's a change in the genome that, that is related to that particular cancer. And so that can be something that, you know, we, we inherited from, a, you know, a parent, but, you know, there's this huge proportion that's all these different things that we're exposed to in modern life, right? And so, you know, we're, we're figuring these things out, right? So UV radiation, we're, uh, I don't think tanning beds are quite as popular as they were when I was a kid. And you know, my kids get slathered in, in sunscreen, whereas, you know, that was not, uh, we, we did sun tanning lotion when I was a kid, um, you know, back in the what 40s and 50s, they would take x-rays of your feet to, to fit your shoes, right? And the doses of radiation were a lot higher for x-rays. Um, we know about, you know, cigarette smoke, you know, preservatives of all kinds can cause, um, seem to have higher incidence of cancer when you consume a lot of those. Um, and then infectious agents, right? So, um, you know, we think about HPV, um, that's the cause of, of cervical cancer uh, in most people. And so now we, we screen for this and we, uh, we've reduced the, the rate tremendously. Um, and then things like uh, H. pylori used to cause a lot of stomach cancer and now we have ways to treat it. So, you know, I think we're, we're learning about all these different things in the environment that can, that can predispose us to cancer. And so, uh, you know, and, and we're working on those too, but we'll, we're also living longer. So that's the other part of it. So as we live longer, there's going to be a higher rate of, of cancers in general, just because of, you know, these random changes over time. So, right. so because just merely by the fact of living longer and then having other sorts of um, exposures to different things, because it's a longer term of exposure. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I could keep writing the same thing over and over and over again, but it, it increases the chance as I get tired, as my body gets more worn out, that I'm going to be making a mistake or a change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. So basically I am getting older and getting more worn out. <laughs> and I got to tell you, 70s looking younger every day to me. Well, we're, and you know, the thing is our quality of life is getting better too, right? So we're, you know, we're not, um, I, I don't see as many debilitating illnesses that, that you know, I saw my great grandparents, for example, um, that type of thing. So, yeah, I think the, the quality of life is getting better. The other thing to think about, especially for for people who had cancers, right? So, you know, I, I showed kind of that that long list of things that can cause DNA damage, and a lot of our chemotherapies, that's how they work, right? They they're essentially causing DNA damage, and and the idea is 
you know, we, we didn't understand this when we were using the, the drugs initially for a lot of them, but you know, the, the basic concept is, is that because the cancer cells are dividing so fast, if you cause more damage to those cells, then that's how you're going to kill them, right? Is you're going to cause so much damage that they can't replicate. Um, whereas hopefully your more healthy cells can overcome the, that, that insult from the chemo. Um, but at the same time, you know, we know that a lot of patients, when they've been given a lot of chemotherapy, certain chemotherapies predispose it to other cancers, right? So it, it's, um, that's one of the, the, it's a double-edged sword. Well, it's, it's no different than if I'm on antibiotics, then, I mean, it messes up the stomach. And so, you know, you're, you're going to have other, other issues, right. You know, and GI issues and what have you, right. Cause it changes it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so. And that's why, and that's why a lot of the, the targeted treatments are really uh, appealing is that, you know, you can, um, you're, you're really targeting what it is the, that's, um, that's really essential for the particular cancer cells to grow. Uh, and that's where there's been a lot of promise of things like that or treatments using things like immunotherapy. So basically, you know, helping your immune system do something to, um, you know, attack the cancer, you know, and get rid of, get rid of it from the inside out, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it only makes sense. It's, it's, it's working um, with an animal more intentional way as far as like taking, telling my body, okay, I'm going to be able to identify whatever this issue is so that we can attack that, go on war with that cancer, I guess this works, right? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So the, the whole series here is biomarker, okay. Biomarker awareness moments, right? And so we started out with how does a cancer develop, right? We kind of got into the phys physical part of like our own personal bodies and how we turn into like DNA, how our, our DNA like replicates, right? And we don't turn into giraffes. We just kind of like keep making on, but I may end up with, with some sort of a cancer as a result of a predisposition towards it, a weakness in it, or just like, from whatever reason, it just kind of like triggered it. Is that, a, is that a fair summary of what we've done over these past two hours? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good high level. Summary. And well, I mean, the other thing to remember is we talked about oncogenes and tumor suppressors. So like what, you know, the idea of one being kind of the gas pedal and one being the brake and that you need changes in both of those for a, for a cancer to happen, um, or at least most cancers. Okay. Yeah. And so, all right. So in quick summary, we're complicated beasts, right? <laughs> and it's, it's going to be a matter of just because I have a cancer doesn't mean when my kids is going to get it. Okay. Because there's different sorts. And just because I have a cancer doesn't necessarily mean that I caused this myself, right? My body is somehow reacted to um, to react in that manner, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's you know it's it's a mixture, right? It's it's a mixture of you know you your genes, your base genome kind of mm -hmm. determines a lot about you know who you are, what you're going to be, but you know all your experiences in life make you who you are, right? And that applies to you know, mentally as, as well as uh, what happens to your, your cells in your body. And, you know, you may have encountered something at one point that, you know, predisposed you to cancer that you never knew about. Uh, and then other people, you know, may live a, a very, um, you know, pristine lifestyle and they, they still, you know, happen to get a cancer. And it's, you know, this issue of the interplay of the two, plus that, that issue of luck uh, kind of pay, plays into it. So just, you know, um, bad things happening to good people. Uh, yeah, that's that whole luck thing that we've got on there. Okay, and so, all right, so the original concept behind this little, it's, it's turned into like a three-part series, okay, is, all right, is genetics, genomics, and biomarkers, okay? So biomarkers, in summary, are anything that I can get a reading on of a biological nature, whether it's my blood pressure or with the biology within my tumor. Yep. Okay. Genomics is something that is what composes me and makes me a human being as opposed to a dog, right? And part of, a, a lot of that is what I've already inherited from both sides of the family. And even though, um, I can't remember what the term was, but so there's, um, and some of those things, I'm just gonna be more susceptible because I've got a predisposition towards it. And other parts of it, um, are like really kind of like unknown. I mean, it's just it's just kind of ongoing and developing, right? Stay tuned for the science near you over the next 20 years, right? 
Um, and let's see, right? And so that's, that's bio, and then biomarkers, genetics, and genomics. And then the genomics, when we're talking about the genomics within our cancer tumor, okay, is only within that tumor. That does not necessarily mean it's industry-wide. It's in my whole, my whole being. All right. Yeah, and then Julie just brought up you can't forget about proteomics and and um, yeah, and that's and that's why biomarkers is such a it's a it's a more all inclusive term and so it includes things like her to you know um, uh, expression in proteins and you know sometimes you can even think of uh, so we got proteins we got RNA you know so so that's why when it came up with um, this idea of comprehensive testing it it really um, it's a great marketing term. But um, you really have to think about it for, for the cancer that you have in front of you. What is it really that we know about that cancer? What are all the different things that we have to test for? So that's the DNA, the RNA, the protein. You know, there may be other, um, there are other biomarkers. So microsaline stability in some cancers. So it's, it, it really is um, that, that comprehensive piece. Um, you have to think, you really do have to say, what is it that matters here? Okay. And so, and that kind of like wraps the whole session up is that, Comprehensive biomarker testing is only as comprehensive as the test that was done on that particular facility based on whatever it was that they had. And, and we used the example before of the blueberry muffin, right? It's like I get blueberry muffin. I can't believe you haven't heard this example before. You get a blueberry muffin, you stick a needle in it, right? You may be able to determine that it, there's blueberries in it, but you don't know the percentage of blueberries, okay? You could possibly hit a spot and you're not even sure it's blueberries, right? You just know it's a berry, right? Or you can get 100% yep. blueberry. Yep. Well, and the other thing, um, you know, that one of the the people who trained me in my fellowship, uh, who's a is a great geneticist. Um, you know, one of his he he worked mostly with pediatric patients, and a lot of our pediatric patients, we weren't able to give them a genetic diagnosis. You know, despite you know years of trying and things like that, and and he would always say, you know, uh, genetics is kind of like genomics is kind of like your cell phone. Like every couple of years, like there's a newer version, there's a better version, we know more, and you should come back. And I think that's true of, of any kind of genomic testing is that if you get an answer that, that's incomplete or is a, a quote unquote negative, um, things are changing all the time. And, and how I practice today is completely different from how I started just seven years ago. And so, um, you know, you, you have to constantly be asking like, is there something new? Is there something, you know, different that we can do, especially because we, we have better treatments and we can be, you know, um, we're going to be going through more treatments over time. Um, so again, that, that would be my, my recommendation is, you know, never stop asking that question, you know, is, is there something else that I should be looking at right now? Okay. And does that have any sort of bearing as far as what lab is doing your test? Um, well, I think, you know, most of the, the laboratory, so most of the laboratories are going to be uh, testing up to the standard of care. And so that gets back to that idea of um, guidelines and things like that. And so, you know, academic labs, the, the bigger commercial laboratories, they're usually going to be, you know, closer to whatever the, the cutting edge is. Um, and then the, the smaller laboratories will usually lag a little bit behind and they're more based on the, the recommendations. Um, but, you know, again, the, the cycle is, is getting so much faster um, that it's, it really is not uncommon for literally there to be, you know, announcement today and we're testing tomorrow or, you know, we're, we're changing how we're reporting things tomorrow. Um, and that, that's pretty common. Uh, so is, is it that much, it's kind of underscores as, as current patient, um, if I have a recurrence to get retested because what's going to be current and actionable today. I mean, we, we all know nobody wants to the insurance and whatever. They, they're not necessarily going to be testing you on things that are unknown as at this point, right? You can get tested for what's actionable, but what's actionable today is going to be different, right? But if I have a recurrence, yeah. okay, God forbid, but if I have one, let's get it tested is if at all possible and know what's going on. Yeah, and, and we see that. Uh, so thinking of lung cancer, um, so EGFR mutated lung cancers. You know, we've we've had drugs for many years now, and so um, what we've seen is like a, as patients relapse over time, and we are seeing patients getting tested more and more, and and we're seeing changes from you know when they started until today. Um, and what's really great for that that particular group of patients is that we actually have treatments um, and also clinical trials. Right. So you can say, oh, you know, this particular drug failed. Here's a new clinical trial that we think this is going to work for these patients. And um, or you know, even better, here's something that's approved. 
Um, so I think that that's always something to where it's worth asking about. Um, and the other part of it is that that insurance piece and, um, you know, a lot of insurance companies have um, restrictions and they say you can only get your genome, your cancer genome tested once per lifetime, which um, kind of made sense when there wasn't, you know, a whole lot of options. But, you know, now because of all the different options that are opening up, it it's, doesn't make as much sense. Um, and so that's, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to to pressure insurance companies and Medicare to to actually um, bring those policies up to date. Yeah, and, and you know, just from personal experience in my own family, in my own life, and in people around me, it's um, the insurance companies, the second part of the equation. The first part of the equation is the doctor and getting the testing. And then even if they do, do, do that testing, getting a copy of your report, looking at your report, and that's going to be what we're talking about on, on March the 1st, but um, getting that report and then taking a look at it. And, 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 and it's okay. You don't expect your oncologist to know everything about it. Okay. They aren't, they don't do what you do. Okay. They're not doing genetics and genomics. They only know the application of it based on other guidelines. So that's just kind of a different part of it. Right. Yeah. And that's actually a really good point. And so um, a lot of what I do um, is actually, you know, when our oncologists find something that, that they don't understand, even if it's not a report that, that my lab generated, you know, they, they call me, they email me and, and we have a discussion about it. And, um, you know, that's something that um, every single one of those reports has a pathologist on the other end like me. And so, you know, if there is something there that, that doesn't make sense, they, they have that resource and, and, you know, we do work really closely with our oncologists. So, um, it never hurts to, you know, encourage that that uh, interaction if you need it. Right. And, and but at the same time, as a patient, you know, or just basically just as a dumb, dumb person, really, it's like there's a part of me that just wants to believe that my doctor knows everything. And that's not necessarily true. OK, a lot of times it's it's a matter of the doctor just has the report and they're going to have to reach out to you. And that's OK for them to say they don't know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and. There's lots of things we don't know, and uh, right. that's why we have colleagues that that we work with that do right. do know. Right, and that's what makes you a specialist and stuff. And I, I want to be respectful of your time and everybody else's time. And yeah, Julie, totally true. The reports in the IHC and the panels do show different parts of your reports, and we're going to be talking about that next time. Um, we have a nurse practitioner. Um, Julie Sandy, that, that's going to be joining us on March the 1st. And so, you know, stay tuned and keep an eye out for the events so that we can do that. That's going to be at noon Eastern time on March the 1st. But thank you so much. I really appreciate everything that you went through and, you know, the confidence that I have that none of my children become giraffes. Um, but, um, and now we know that uh, the difference between genetics, genomics, and biomarkers. Oh my, right? So thank you for all you're doing. And I hope to see you again. I always hope to see you again soon. No, absolutely. This is, this is great. Thank you very much. And then if there are questions that come up, um, you know, please send them my way and, and uh, so we can answer them for um, the folks here today. Yeah, definitely. I think what we're going to start doing is we're going to do a follow up. And if there's any questions that hit up, um, we're going to like acquire those and like maybe drop them in our newsletter. Um, so rather than keeping everybody on for a long period of time afterwards, we're making them shorter and sweeter so that we can get, get folks like you on here. Well, thank you so great. much. And have a great day, Eric. I really appreciate you doing it. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. All Take right. care. Bye now. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you again next time. And take care. Enjoy the day. Bye.